Thank you for the, the introduction and thank you for, for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here, um, especially because I told a, a couple of people this. It's okay if I walk a little bit. Um, uh, my son, my nine-year-old son is a big Villanova basketball fan, um, quite randomly. I think he mostly just likes the V that I see on a, a few of your sweatshirts. So he's been a Villanova basketball fan for a few years now. Villanova is the second team after Michigan State, which is my team, my, my alma mater. Um, so for him, Having my book discussed in the New York Times and being invited to give a talk at Villanova are by far the two most impressive things I've ever done work-wise. So that's, that's uh, you know, a particular treat. Um, so as Brian said, I'm going to talk today about my newest book, my fifth book, which focuses on the constitutional vision of Governor Morris. And I'm well aware that many people's reaction to that will be, well, why the heck should I care about Governor Morris, if not even who is Governor Morris? So I want to start by, by uh, make, kind of making my case on that score about, you know, why should we care about this guy at all? And my case, to put it in a nutshell, is that he's quite possibly the most interesting of the American founders, period. And he's almost certainly the most important of the founders that few people have ever heard of. So I'll spend a few minutes on each of these, kind of first, who he was, why he's so fascinating, and second, why he's so important. So one scholar declared recently in a book on James Madison that Morris may have been the most colorful individual in North America at the time of the founding. And frankly, that seems about right to me. Um, so biographers often claim, this isn't a biography of Morris, my book, but biographers often claim, it's almost a cliche to claim, that their chosen subject's life contained all the elements of a great novel or a great movie. I think in Morris's claim that in Morris's case, that claim happens to be quite true, although the movie would likely require an R rating on account of both sex and violence. So Morris was a peg-legged ladies' man with a really wicked sense of humor. Uh, he, he was without question one of the funniest of the founders. That's not a super high bar. Um, the founders were on the whole uh, an unusually serious lot. I think Benjamin Franklin is the only real rival for the title of, of funniest founder. Um, so I mentioned that Morris had a wooden leg, so he, he lost his leg or part of his leg um, at age 28 as a result of a bad carriage accident, although there were always whispers following him throughout his life that he'd in fact injured the leg jumping out the window to escape the wrath of an ill-timed husband. Um, his peg leg doesn't seem to have diminished the, his appeal to women. He went on to engage in a long string of amorous adventures across two continents. Uh, but let me back up and start from the beginning. So he's originally from New York. He was from a wealthy family that owned um, the, the, most of the southwest part of what's now the Bronx. But his father died when he was 10, and the bulk of it is his inheritance went to his older step siblings from his, his father's first marriage. So he has this kind of quasi-aristocratic lineage, but he was left to mostly make his own way in the world, which he did very well. He was always very good at making money, um, both through working as a lawyer and especially through land speculation. He came up, as, as so many of the founders did, he came up through revolutionary politics. He helped to, it was a struggle, but he helped to eventually push New York to join the, the independence movement as a member of the state's provincial congress. He was one of the three principal architects of the New York State Constitution, along with his friends John Jay and Robert R. Livingston. So that would be really good, I think, uh, useful experience for, for his um, time at the Philadelphia Convention a decade later. In 1778, he became a member of the Continental Congress. He sort of stepped onto the national stage, where, among other things, he joined a committee that was uh, put together to oversee the ar Army's needs. And as part of that, he spent that terrible winter at Valley Forge. And he met George Washington, who became, um, I don't think it's too strong to say, Morris's lifelong political hero. Um, they, were, they were a somewhat odd pair. They became good friends. They were a somewhat odd pair with Washington's sort of dignified reserve contrasting pretty strongly with Morris's irrepressible, irrepressible boldness and rakishness, but again, they seem to have gotten on quite well. So he, uh, in addition to, to his involvement in the Constitution, he also signed the Articles of Confederation, the country's first stab at a national constitution on behalf of New York, although he didn't like it much. He, he thought the Confederation government was pretty inadequate from the get-go. Um, in 1781, he became the Deputy Superintendent of Finance, where he worked along with Robert Morris, another founding Morris, they weren't related to one another, uh, to develop a financial program that saved the public credit and with it really the revolution itself by, by helping or enabling the Congress to just barely keep troops supplied and in the field. And here's a fun bit of trivia for you. 
So he was, again, I say, he's the deputy superintendent of finance. In that role, he drew up a plan for a new national currency for the United States where he said, hey, we should use the word dollar after the widely used Spanish dollar to denote the, the basic unit of currency. He invented the word cent to denote one of the smaller coins. So we use words from him almost every day. He's the reason we have dollars and cents as our, the, the terms for our currency. In 1787, of course, he attended the Philadelphia Convention. Uh, most of my talk is going to focus on that, so I won't say anything more about it now. I will note, though, that after the convention's close, Alexander Hamilton urged him to contribute to the Federalist, or what we often call the Federalist Papers. So it was initially supposed to be Hamilton, Morris, and John Jay, these three kind of up-and-coming New Yorkers, all good friends, who are going to write the Federalist or the Federalist Papers. It was only after Morris turned him down that... Hamilton turned to James Madison, which makes Madison, as, as one scholar has put it, the most consequential backup choice in the entire history of political theory. Um, it's, it's fascinating, I think, to, to ponder what the Federalist would have looked like if it had been Morris rather than Madison writing for it. Um, what I think we can say for, for, for certain is that he, Morris would be much more famous today than he currently is. Um, in any case, Morris w was destined to become an important player in not just one, but two of the great revolutions of the modern age because in 1789, he went to Paris. He eventually followed in the footsteps of Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, became the American minister to France. He was there at the convening of the Estates General. He was, in fact, the only foreign diplomat from any nation to remain in Paris through the whole course of the terror. So he was quite skeptical about the French Revolution from the get-go. Um, very early on, even before Edmund Burke, he, he voiced worries about the French Revolution. I think a lot of the, his warnings about the chaos that the revolutionaries would unleash were, were very much borne out. Um, he started keeping a diary when he was in France. He wrote lots of letters back to President Washington, Secretary of State Jefferson, which are, I think offer really some of the fa most fascinating first-hand accounts of the revolution anywhere. Um, they're often pretty funny as well. So in one letter to Washington, he described the king, King Louis XVI, as a small beer character who at the slightest show of opposition gives up everything and every person. He described Jacques Necker, who was the, the popular finance minister, as a very poor financier whose plans were inevitably feeble and ineptious. And my favorite, he described the Count de Montmorin, who is the, the, foreign minister, or, sorry, the minister of foreign affairs, as a man who means well very well, but he means it feebly. Anyway, he, he did a fairly, I think, heroic job navigating the just revolving door of factions that headed the, the French government during the heady days of the revolution, each more extreme and violent than the last. He did what he could to protect American citizens from arbitrary arrest, protect American commerce from unfavorable regulations. When things were at their worst, he hid people in his house to help them escape the guillotine. After his ministry ended, he traveled around Europe for a few more years, then came back to the United States and served the second half of his senatorial term. So he was a Federalist senator from New York for three years um, during a really critical period when the Capitol moved to Washington, D.C., and the Republicans took power. So this is 1800 to 1803. In 1804, after the famous, everybody knows about the famous duel between Hamilton and Aaron Burr, Morris was the one who sat by Hamilton's deathbed, the one who gave his official eulogy um, at the request of Eliza, Hamilton's wife, who, who told Morris, you're the best friend that Hamilton had in the world. Not that that would be enough to earn him even a bit role in the musical. No appearance of Governor Morris in the musical, despite being Alexander Hamilton's best friend, which is a hugely missed opportunity, right? You could have this irrepressible rake, you know, uh, peg leg running around on stage. Again, a, a real missed opportunity. Late in life, he undertook two more great projects, one helping to lead a commission that planned the grid layout for the streets of Manhattan, and another that planned the Erie Canal. During his very last years, he was a sort of elder statesman of the Federalist Party. He grew so disenchanted with the ascendancy of the Republicans, with the War of 1812, that he ended up supporting the secession of New York and New England from the Union. Um, I devote the book's epilogue to that, so I'm happy to say more about that later, if you like. On the more personal side of things, at age 57, Morris finally became the last of the founders to marry. He married a woman named Nancy Randolph, who was a sort of fallen aristocrat, more than two decades his junior, who was then serving as his housekeeper, and who had earlier been accused of conspiring to murder her own newborn baby fathered by her brother-in-law, which is a long story. 
Um, they had a, a son together, although the Morris died before the, his son even turned four. Even his death was colorful, if rather grisly. I, um, I debated about whether to include this in the talk, but, but what the hell. Um, he seems to have often suffered from pretty painful blockages in his urinary tract, uh, maybe the result of venereal disease. And when he was 64, he tried using a whalebone to remove the blockage, and it killed him. He died from the resulting lacerations. So I apologize for giving you that mental image to carry around with you. OK, so that's his life. Let me say something now about his importance. Right? You might be thinking, OK, he's definitely a colorful guy. He lived a colorful life. But still, why should I care about him? Why should I care about his constitutional vision? Was he just a somewhat kooky bit player? among the founders? And the answer is not at all, or at least not as far as the Constitution is concerned. In fact, he was arguably the single dominant figure at the Philadelphia Convention. He spoke more often at the convention than anyone else. He had proposed more motions at the convention than anyone else. He had more motions accepted at the convention than anyone else. His speeches, his, his uh, kind of interventions were often extremely blunt and provocative. They all but leap off the page at you. If you read through Madison's notes uh, from the convention that Morris, you know, everything Morris has really jumps off the page. Um, he also served on a number of the committees that did so much of the important work that summer. I think only three other members, three delegates served on more committees than he did. So he was just everywhere that summer. He did, he, he did, uh, uh, he was all over the place which is something that close observers have long recognized. So no less an authority on the convention's doings than James Madison described Morris as being among the most able, eloquent, and active delegates. No less an authority on the Constitution than John Marshall claimed that Morris, quote, performed a most splendid part in its framing. Later in the 19th century, Theodore Roosevelt wrote an entire biography of Morris. He judged that he was perhaps the most brilliant of the framers. Henry Cabot Lodge declared that no man did more, greater work, sorry, no man did better work in the great task of forming the Constitution than Morris. Um, so I'll say more about kind of Morris's vision for the Constitution, his impact on its provisions in, in a little bit. For now, I'll just say that he was one of the two chief architects of the presidency as we know it, along with James Wilson. He was also far and away the staunchest critic of slavery at the convention. And most importantly of all, so I, I worry that I might have buried the lead on this. Most importantly of all, Morris was the one who wrote the Constitution itself. So at the end of the summer, the delegates formed a five-person committee of style to write a final draft of the Constitution. And this committee basically just said, hey, Morris, you do it. Um, it's unbelievable to me that so few people know this. So most American school children can tell you who wrote the Declaration of Independence. Um, very few people know who wrote the Constitution, I, I, no matter how well they read they may be. I bet if you polled PhDs in political science, it's a pretty small fraction that could tell you that Governor Morris wrote the Constitution. Um, I've never done a formal poll, but I've asked many, many people this over the past couple of years as I've, I've worked on this book. And, you know, most people, but some people assume it might, might have been Madison, right, because we call him father of the Constitution, or that it was just a, a collective effort. Um, Obviously, in some ways, it was a collective effort in the sense that, you know, the Constitution's provisions were, were laboriously debated and voted on before, before Morris took up a, a, his pen. But, and so he didn't, you know, his leeway in choosing the structure of the powers of the government was minimal. But I do think it's fair to say he wrote the Constitution every bit as much as Jefferson wrote the Declaration, right? Je Jefferson's Declaration, too, went through lots of revisions and, and, and so forth. But Morris single-handedly and pretty radically reorganized the, so that there had been a draft constitution prior to his draft. It, midway through the summer, what was known as the Committee of Detail produced a draft constitution. But it had 23 sprawling articles. He pared it down to a neat seven. He changed or chose a great deal of the wording, often in, I think, pretty consequential ways. And so when we pour over, when constitutional lawyers and scholars pour over the fine details of the document, you know, why this word that, rather than that word, this semicolon, you know, whatever, it's Morris that they have to thank or to blame for many of those details. And he wrote the famous preamble, the, the Constitution's ringing of statement of purpose. He wrote the preamble basically from scratch. All the stuff about you know, forming a more perfect union, establishing justice, ensuring domestic tranquility and the like, that's all Morris. Um, and this has, of course, been, become one of the most famous uh, celebrated sentences in the annals of democracy. So it's something of an irony that it was written by a man of rather elitist inclinations who's all but forgotten today. 
Anyway, the, the point is, Morris was more, by far more than anyone else the author of the Constitution, right? One of the, the, the charter by which we still live, one of the most important texts in world history. So this may be a somewhat silly debate, um, but I think there's a case to be made, a pretty plausible case, that Morris deserves the title father of the Constitution every bit as much as James Madison does. Um, and it's not just me or, or Ham, uh, uh, Morris's handful of admirers who say that. Um, Joseph Ellis, who I'm sure many of you know of, he's probably the most popular historian writing on the founding today, he says that as well in a couple of the books. Partly that's because I think Madison probably deserves his title less than, than is often supposed. Um, he did, you know, Madison did a lot of things that Morris didn't. He helped to lead the call for the convention to be uh, uh, f held in the first place. He helped to set it, he helped to f formulate the Virginia plan, the, 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 the set the kind of convention's agenda. He defended the, the Constitution in the Federalist at the critical ratifying convention in Virginia. Um, but in terms of what's actually included in the Constitution, Madison really didn't get his way. He, he was far less um, successful, far less enamored with the Constitution than many people suppose. Um, he lost more battles than he won in Philadelphia, Madison did, including some of those that he deemed most important. And so right after the conventions closed, he wrote deject dejectedly to his friend Jefferson to lament that even if the Constitution were to be adopted, it still wouldn't, quote, effectually answer its national object. So again, at the, the convention itself, Morris com uh, contributed to the debates more than Madison did. He was more successful in getting his proposals adopted than Madison was. And above all, again, he penned the Constitution itself. So I think it's, you know, not bad for, for someone whose name most Americans wouldn't even recognize. So let me turn then with that to, to what's the, really the main subject of the book, which is his, what I call his constitutional vision. Um, so I'm already 20 minutes in here, so I, 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 I'll, I'll just touch on a few of the highlights. So the book devo devotes separate chapters to his views and, and contributions with respect to federalism and the role of the states, the Senate, the House of Representatives, presidential selection, the presidency itself, the judiciary, slavery, and the preamble. Um, and this is, a, you know, maybe I should note, this is the first book ever to be written on this subject, on his, his constitutional views. I think virtually every statement that Madison ever made uh, about the Constitution has by now been parsed nearly to death. And so it seems to me that the, the guy who has, an, I think, equally strong claim to the title father of the Constitution should be given at least a fraction of that attention. Um, I'll just say one more thing before I jump in, which is that I think everyone who reads my book will find something to dislike in Morris's constitutional vision. It's not going to be um, uh, congenial to, to everyone. He privileges property and wealth in a way that I think will be anathema to many people on the left, but he also embraces a kind of powerful, far-reaching federal government that will just as surely rankle those on the right. But I do think that there are lots of ways in which he was almost astoundingly prescient. He saw, foresaw as clearly as any of the founders did the need within America's constitutional order for a, pop, a powerful pro president, excuse me, a powerful executive with a popular mandate, an independent judiciary armed with the power of judicial review, the central role that parties, political parties, would come to play in American life, which most of the founders were just oblivious to, he foresaw quite clearly, um, and above all, as I'll say toward the end of my talk, the unfathomable evils that slavery visited on American life. So again, his vision is, um, Sometimes quirky, sometimes frankly implausible in, in places, but I think um, pretty amazingly foresighted on others. So with that, let me turn to the, the first part of his, Morris's constitutional vision that I want to touch on, which is his view, views on, on federalism and the role of the states. And here his views are actually pretty straightforward. He wanted to augment the powers of the national government and to diminish the powers of the state governments pretty much as far as possible, or, or pretty much as far as he could get. Um, he was really one of the leaders of the nationalist camp at the convention, along with James Madison and James Wilson. Nationalist here meaning not, you know, kind of America first in the international realm, but rather you know, wanting to augment the power of the national government at the expense of the states. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say he's the most uncompromising nationalist at the convention. There were others, including Alexander Hamilton, who would have basically wiped the states off the map if he could have, and I don't think Morris would have gone quite that far, but I think he was arguably the most passionate 
nationalists at the convention. Because this is a time, remember, this is a time they're under the Articles of Confederation. The states are still the real sovereign powers of America. Most people feel a stronger attachment to their state than to this abstract idea of America or, or the United States. And this is something that Morris thought definitely needed to be changed. He, he thought, uh, like Madison, he thought that the, the state governments were tended to be deeply problematic, um, that b both because of their own internal problems, that you know, too, too much majority tyranny and so forth, and also because they too frequently stood in the way of the, the national interest. So at one point during the convention, he stood up and asked, quote, if all the charters and constitutions of the states were thrown into the fire and all their demagogues into the ocean, what would it be to the happiness of America? Which I think probably raised more than a few eyebrows. Time and again, he insisted that state attachments and state importance had been the bane of this country. And time and again, he berated his fellow delegates for what he regarded as their provincialism, for acting as if they'd been assembled there in Philadelphia in order to, as he put it, truck and bargain for their particular states. So most of the delegates very self-consciously thought of themselves as I'm a delegate from Virginia or Massachusetts or South Carolina or whatever. Morris said again and again that he had come there as a representative of America. Um, now, I should know, I, I don't think I said this, he was originally from New York, he planned to return there, um, he did return there after his European travels, but as of 1787, he'd been living in Philadelphia for more than seven years, so he was a delegate from Pennsylvania. You all can claim him as, as one of your own. Um, but the point being, I, you know, it's probably easier for Morris than most to adopt this um, broad-minded cosmopolitan outlook. He, he's, he's a transplant, he's also, of course, um, you know, fairly rich, he has these far-flung business adventures, he's a bachelor, he's just far more geographically mobile than, than most of the, the delegates were. But still, I think it's safe to say that, you know, the convention probably would have gone a lot more smoothly and probably would have produced a better constitution if they, they'd, uh, you know, more delegates that he did his pleas to, to rise above these local considerations, sectional jealousies. Substantively or structurally speaking, he, Morris advocated granting the national government a great deal of power, including what was known as the general police power, meaning the power of making policy within the states. Um, in terms of the debate that took up more time than any other debate over the course of the convention, which is the debate over the basis of representation in the Senate, right? Is the Senate going to be based on, uh, representation in the Senate can be based on population or equal representation for each state. Morris was, in, firmly in the typical large state camp, which is to say for proportional representation in both houses of Congress. Like the other nationalists, he thought it was patently unjust to grant people more effective political power just because they happened to hail from a smaller state, um, which is what equal state representation in the Senate would do and does do, right? Um, and so we tend to think of this, right, we, we sometimes call it the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise, where we have, you know, proportional representation in the House of Representatives, equal state representation in the Senate. We like to think of this as a great, you know, kind of even Stephen, happy compromise, everybody wins. Most of the big names among the founders, Morris, but also Madison, uh, Washington, Hamilton, James Wilson, they all took it as a devastating defeat. Morris was all but ready to walk out of the convention. Um, he, he was so distraught by this this decision. So this brings me to the next topic I wanted to, to discuss, namely Congress. So when it comes to um, Congress, his views I think were more idiosyncratic and, and more complex than his views of federalism. He advocated things with respect to both houses of Congress that have given him a reputation at least as a rather brazen elitist, but as I'll try to explain, he advocated these things precisely in hopes of checking the power of the elite or preventing the rich from accumulating too much political power. So let me start with the House of Representatives. One of Morris's main interventions here was to advocate that there should be some kind of property qualification on voting, that only landholders should be able to vote for members of the House. Now he's far from the only delegate to push for this. Lots and lots of others did so as well, including Madison for a time, you know, a lot of the big names. But for most of the other delegates, the reason why they wanted a property qualification on voting was that they distrusted the poor. They thought the poor were ignorant and uninformed and even vicious, and so you shouldn't trust them with the vote, right? Um, Morris, on the other hand, advocated a property qualification um, because ironically or, or counterintuitively, he thought that that would limit the political power of the rich. So why would that be? Well, his basic argument was 
that if people who didn't own property were enfranchised, then they would, as he bluntly put it, sell their votes to the rich or perhaps be forced to vote a certain way by their employers. And this is, of course, a much, it sounds crazy to us today. This is a much bigger worry in an age where no jurisdiction used a secret ballot of the kind that we take for granted today. Mostly it's an open voice vote. Everybody knows how you're voting, right? And so it was really not uncommon in early America for the wealthy to um, kind of commandeer the votes of the poor through bi bribery or bullying. And so Morris reasoned, okay, look, if we limit the vote to those who, who own property, to landholders, then they're all you know, well off enough to make an independent choice. You're not gonna, um, the, the, and so he thought the house would be more likely to reflect the views, the interests of the common people, rather than the rich who, who we can, again, be, be able to redouble their vote, voting power by commandeering the votes of the, the poor. Um, so, Again, Morris's reasoning wasn't the poor themselves are vicious or untrustworthy or whatever, but rather that they're too, it would be too easy for the rich to manipulate them or, or to, to exploit them. Um, obviously, and I think we can say thankfully, he didn't get his way here to, right, in his efforts to disenfranchise the poor, but th that was his, his argument. When it came to the Senate, his views were similarly counterintuitive, or I think maybe even more counterintuitive. So he, he gave a very long and audacious speech on July 2nd at the convention, where he argued that the Senate should be made up of exclu exclusively of wealthy individuals who would be chosen by the president and who would serve for life without pay. And strangely enough, he thought that this too would limit the political power of the rich. So why in the world would that be? Okay, so first let me back up. First of all, he thought that the main purpose of the Senate was to check what he called the precipitation, changeableness, and excesses that he assumed would characterize the House of Representatives. So the sort of turbulent populism of the House needed to be checked by the Senate. And he thought that this kind of Senate that he was envisioning would be in the best position to do so, right? They'd be wealthy, the senators would be wealthy, this would give them an incentive to fight against any sort of populist inroads uh, uh, against private property. Um, their lifetime appointments would of course give them the independence, the security to take unpopular stands. Um, now this too, um, conceiving of the Senate as an aristocratic body or for, exclusively for the wealthy, even with lifetime appointments, this is something a surprisingly large number of other delegates um, supported. I, I think you'd be surprised if you went back and looked at you know, who, who, who argued for very long, if not lifelong terms for senators, including Alexander Hamilton. Um, here again, though, Morris's motivations or his reasoning was unique. So most of the other delegates who advocated something like this advocated it because they thought wealthy elites are more trustworthy than the common people. Um, whereas Morris did so precisely because he did not trust them. He repeatedly stressed that the rich were generally corrupt and power hungry and all too eager to oppress the poor. So then the obvious question is, why then would you hand over the Senate to these corrupt people? Well, he argued that the rich would actually be easier to restrain if they were isolated and confined to the Senate, right? You confine them to the Senate, then the people and the representatives from the House can watch them like a hawk, right? Uh, scrutinize their every move, resist any oppressive measures they tried to take. Um, so he's trying to find a way to, to pit ambition against ambition, to, to use Madison's dictum from Federalist 51. Um, I should say as a side note, this is also something very similar to what John Adams advocated. Adams wasn't there at the Philadelphia Convention, but in, in his magnum opus called The Defense of the Constitutions of the United States, Madison described the confinement of the rich, the well-born to the Senate as in effect an ostracism, right? We're ostracizing them into the Senate. Um, now this too, I think is definitely not without its problems. There are very big problems with it. I go through several of the problems in the book. I'm, I, I won't bother doing so here. But I'll just say one thing, I guess, in his defense here, which is that in um, trying to find some way to limit the, the influence of the rich on the political process, he was groping around for a solution that I think we still haven't act adequately solved in the United States. So the mere fact that he saw that this would be a problem and, and was, you know, again, trying to find ways to, to fix it was uh, a testament to his foresight and his realism. Okay. All in all, when it came to Congress, Morris really didn't get his way on much, nor I don't think will his vision be terribly, terribly congenial to many people today. Despite, again, he has the best of intentions. He, he's not trying to, be, uh, to promote the political power of the rich. But, um, but when it came to the presidency, he was much more successful, and I think his, his, uh, his vision will be much more appealing today. So let me turn to the presidency next. So he was, I've mentioned this at the outset, Morris was, along with James Wilson, one of the two main architects of the presidency as we know it. Um, I'll, I'll start with the issue of 
presidential selection, so how the president was chosen. This was, I think, the second most contentious, second, the, the, the uh, su su subject that took the second most time at the Philadelphia Convention after the, again, rep rep basis of representation in the Senate. And I don't think, if you read through the notes, I don't think many people realize how close they came to having Congress choose the president, which would have made, gone a long way toward making the American system a parliamentary rather than a presidential system in, in contemporary terms. Um, for basically the entire summer, all but a couple of weeks of the summer, the plan on the table included congressional selection of the president. A clear majority of the delegates there, that's what they wanted. And that almost certainly would have happened had it not been for Morris and Wilson just fighting doggedly against it. So Morris had two main objections to congressional selection of the president. Namely, first, that the outcome would be the, the result of kind of partisan factional infighting. Um, like the, the election of a pope by the conclave of cardinals, as he put it. And second, that it would render the, the president subservient to Congress, right? It would just undermine the, the system of checks and balances. And so what he advocated instead, like, like Wilson, was direct popular election of the president. They thought, you know, simple enough, have the people vote. Um, most of the other delegates found this idea to be utterly preposterous. There is no, never a majority behind this. Um, there's never any chance of it passing. So as an alternative, the two of them, again, Morris and Wilson, devised the, our really convoluted electoral college system as the next best option, the, the kind of the closest thing they could get to a presidential, uh, a, a direct election. Um, so using electors rather than a direct election solves some problems with respect to the small states and especially the slave states that I won't go into. Um, but uh, I'll just reiterate, again, Morris himself, despite being one of the chief architects of the, the Electoral College, regarded it as the second best option. He, he would have preferred a direct vote by the people themselves. Morris also did everything that he could uh, through the debates, through various committees, and, and as the author of the final draft of the Constitution, to enhance the president's powers. So the, the powers of the presidency as it emerged from the convention were far greater than I think almost anyone would have thought going in. Um, again, thanks in large part to Morris and also Wilson, although Morris, I think, would have liked it to be stronger still. So he advocated, among other things, that the president should have broad-ranging powers over foreign affairs, a role in setting the legislative agenda, an absolute veto over legislation, meaning a, a veto that Congress couldn't then override, and almost unbelievably expansive appointment powers. So he thought that the president should be able to appoint cabinet officers, federal judges, and Supreme Court justices, and remember also senators for life without any need for congressional approval. Um, so I won't go through all of his arguments on these scores. It, it would just take more time than I've got. I'll just say there are two general reasons why he wanted to make the, the presidency as strong as he could or almost as strong as possible. The first was he thought that you needed to empower the presidency to stand up to Congress. He thought, along with a lot of the other founders, he expected Congress to be the po most powerful, most dangerous of the three branches, and remember also to be dominated by these wealthy elites who are buying up the votes of the rich, and, or, or, or the poor, rather. Um, and the second reason why he wanted to make the, the presidency so strong was that he knew, as everybody knew, uh, that it was a foregone conclusion that the first president would be his friend and hero, George Washington. Right, so he trusted Washington that not abuse his powers. Um, anyway, he didn't get everything he wanted with regard to the presidency, but he got a great deal of what he wanted, and um, he, he shaped the, the office as much as anyone. Um, I, I think you can make a good case that he deserved every bit as much as um, James, Wil James Wilson is often called the father of the American presidency, and I think Morris could share that title probably as well. Um, you know what, in the interest of time, I think I'm just gonna skip over what I was gonna say about his, his views on the judiciary. Um, like the other founders, he just said far less about the courts than the other two branches. They, it sometimes seemed that they spent so much time debating the structure, the powers of the, the presidency and, and Congress that um, the judiciary seemed like the, one scholar called it the forgotten, the forgotten stepchild of 1787. Um, I'll just say he, despite only talking about the judiciary a handful of times, he wanted to make the judiciary a true co-equal branch, one that could stand up to the other uh, two branches that would be armed with the power of judicial review to check Congress and especially to check the state governments. Um, uh, but I'll leave it at that so that I have more time to devote to what was, um, I think, almost certainly his, most, his, his finest hour at the convention from, from today's perspective, which came in the debates over slavery. 
So no one at the convention spoke more passionately or more eloquently or at greater length about the evils of slavery than Morris did. He called slavery a nefarious institution and the curse of heaven on the states where it prevailed. So he gives a long speech on August 8th. I'll, I'll read a, a paragraph from it in a minute. It has been called the first abolitionist speech in American public life, which is probably an exaggeration, but uh, you know, there's, I, I think, something to it. And this is all the more remarkable when we remember his audience, right? There's probably a couple dozen people sitting in the room who are themselves slaveholders who he's speaking to. Um, so the speech, again, I'm going to read a paragraph from it. He gives in, in opposition to the three-fifths compromise, so the, the, to, to counting three-fifths of the enslaved population toward representation in the House and, and at least eventually also the, the Electoral College. And his basic argument is that there was no good reason why enslaved people should count at all toward the, the representation according to any ratio. So he rhetorically asked, are they, meaning enslaved people, are they men? Then make them citizens and let them vote. Are they mere property? Well, then why then is no other property included in, in the representation? And this, you know, I think these questions were unanswerable, which is why the Southern delegates fairly even, scarcely even attempted to do so. Um, so the, uh, it was just, a, frankly, a power ploy. The, the Three-Fifths Compromise is just a way of augmenting the political power of the slaveholding South, one that would also encourage them to import still more <laughs> enslaved people, to get still more representation, more power. Um, anyway, let me read the, the climax of Morris's speech in opposition to this clause. Morris says, quote, the admission of slaves into the representation when fairly explains come to this, that the inhabitant of Georgia or South Carolina who goes to the coast of Africa and in defiance of the most sacred laws of humanity tears away his fellow creatures from their dearest connections and damns them to the most cruel bondage shall have more votes in a government instituted for the protection of the rights of mankind than the citizen of Pennsylvania or New Jersey who views with laudable horror so nefarious a practice. And Morris goes on to say that giving the South extra political representation on behalf of those whom they enslaved would require, quote, a sacrifice of every principle of right, of every impulse of humanity. Now, of course, for all of his moral clarity and passion and eloquence, on this topic, Morris failed to make much headway against slavery. The Three-Fifths Compromise was, of course, included, as well as a clause protecting the overseas slave trade until 1808, and the Fugitive Slave Clause. They're all included in the Constitution over his fierce objections. Um, I say in the book, he effectively served as the framer's conscience on this issue, but as sometimes happens, you know, that conscience was all too often ignored. Um, I'll also say on that note, I think, you know, not only does this speech, of course, Morris look, make him look pretty good from today's vantage point, I also think it makes the other founders look worse by comparison um, in the sense that, you know, historians always remind us that, well, we shouldn't judge figures of the past on the basis of today's values, right? Which I guess is true to a certain extent. But this speech of, of Morris's makes it harder for me to accept the idea that, you know, the poor founders, as mere creatures of their times, they couldn't possibly have known any better with regard to slavery, right? Morris knew better, and he was one of them, and he told them so. Um, of course, he was a northerner, but he came from a slaveholding family. His, his father owned or, or held in bondage several dozen people when Morris was a child. His mother still enslaved three people when she died the year before the convention in 1786. But Morris was clear-sighted enough about this from the beginning. He fought it as early as the New York State Constitutional Convention in 1777, when he's only 25 years old and when slavery was still legal and practiced in all 13 states. At the St New York State Constitution, Constitutional Convention, he urged them to ensure that, quote, in future ages, every human being who breathes the air of this state shall enjoy the privileges of a free man. But of course, he failed there too, just as he would later in Philadelphia. As it turned out, New York was the last of the northern states, or maybe New Jersey was one of the last of the northern states to pass a gradual abolition law. Slavery persisted within the state until 1827. Um, but anyway, at both of the constitutional conventions that he participated in, uh, I think Morris was at his courageous and far-sighted best when it came to slavery. Let me conclude by addressing a question that some of you may well be wondering about, I, that I certainly wondered about as I worked on the book, which is, why have I barely heard of this guy before? Right? If he's so fascinating, so important, why is he so little known? Um, one scholar's put it, you know, it, it's ironic that Morris has been so widely forgotten when he's seemingly so unforgettable. 
Now, as you might expect, his, his, you know, he has a handful of admirers anyway, uh, who I've come to know uh, in the course of writing this book, who've put forward potential explanations for this. You know, why has Morris been forgotten? I have to say, I'm not sure that I'm by any of them, at least taken in isolation. So one common suggestion is that Morris's elitism and his criticisms of unfettered democracy are just so offensive to our sen political sensibilities that we could never embrace him as one of the nation's key founders. Um, but then again, I think his el elitism is often overstated or misunderstood, right? I've tried to suggest that what, what seems like elitism was actually trying to limit the powers of the elite. Um, and in any case, I think a whiff of political iconoclasm can just as often be as alluring as off-putting. So Alexander Hamilton remains a core member of our founding pantheon despite being second to none in his misgivings about popular self-rule. Another common suggestion is that Morris's somewhat licentious lifestyle undercuts the, the sort of aura of gravitas that we expect to, from our, our venerable founders. And I do think this probably did help to explain why he was disdained by many during his lifetime. But you might think that a predilection for fun and sex and money would be less offensive in our age, our, our, our less censorious age. Um, maybe it would even be a boon rather than a hindrance to his reputation. In any way, I don't think Benjamin Franklin's eminence has been hurt by his, his kind of fun-loving, amorous ways. Still another potential reason for the lack of attention paid to Morris is that he never wrote a big substantial work for scholars to pour over, right? Nothing on the scale of the Federalist or Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia or Adams' defense of the constitutions or even Franklin's autobiography. Um, then again, neither did Washington. Um, and in any way, I, I do think there's plenty of material to, to analyze as I, I, with Mor in Morris's case, case, as I hope my book shows. It's also true that Morris never held as high an office under the Constitution as the more famous founders did. He never became president or, or treasury secretary, say. Then again, the posts that he did hold, minister to France and senator, weren't exactly nothing. And anyway, it seems to me that Jefferson would be widely remembered today merely for having written the Declaration of Independence, even if he'd never become president, whereas Morris's penning of the Constitution hasn't been enough to put him anywhere near the same level. A final potential explanation that I'll mention lies in Morris's potential, dis, or, sorry, Morris's disenchantment with the state of American politics toward the end of his life. So again, he, late in life he advocates northern secession, and, and this seems to give him the aura almost of a traitor to, to some. On the other hand, as I tried to show in my last book before this one, a book called Fears of a Setting Sun, basically all of the founders who lived into the 19th century grew deeply disillusioned with America's political order. Basically, Madison is the only exception on this score. Um, not all of them went so far as to advocate disunion, but Jefferson came very close to, to, to doing that. Um, so I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, maybe his, his obscurity lies in some combination of these factors or all of these factors. Maybe it's just the result of the vagaries of fortune. Um, but it's made, this puzzle to me is made all the more confounding by the fact that, again, he was a more forthright, eloquent critic of slavery than any of the big, famous founding fathers, right? So in, in this age when you know, many people have been quite uncomfortable lauding Jefferson or Madison or Washington too unreservedly because of their complicity in this institution, um, Morris would seem to be all the more attractive. And so just that, you know, even if you leave everything else uh, aside that he did, which I, again, I've tried to suggest it quite a lot. Just the fact that he wrote the Constitution and gave the strongest anti-slavery orations at the Philadelphia Convention, you'd think that alone would be enough to assure, ensure him a place near the top of any list of the most illustrious founders, at least on a par with, let's say, Aaron Burr, whose main claim to fame is having shot someone important. So, that's it. My, my hope is that one day Morris will be given his due. Who knows, maybe my own book will play a, a small part in making that, that happen. Um, I'll stop there, but I'm, I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks. Do you have any Um, no, Paine was a huge fan of the re revolution. So they, they had opposite views. So they, 
Um, Payne, they didn't n know each other uh, personally, but Payne blamed Morris for not fighting hard enough as the minister to France to get him out of jail. So, so Payne was thrown in jail during one of the you know, later crazier phases of the French Revolution. And um, you know, he was stuck in jail for a long time and he blamed Morris for not fighting vigorously enough on his behalf. We do have a, a, a very terse note. So Morris didn't spend a whole lot of time reading political theory. You know, as a political theorist, I, you know, one of the natural questions is always, well, was he inspired by Locke or Hume or Blackstone or who, you know, who, who were his intellectual sources? He doesn't see, I mean, I think he read most of those people. He's a, he's a well-educated man, but he doesn't seem to have put a lot of stock into political theory. One of the very few um, kind of remarks we have about this, he has very extensive diaries, um, but he says something in the midst of the revolution that, about how he had read both um, Burke's reflections on, Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France, one of the greatest criticisms of the French Revolution, and then Thomas Paine's Rights of Man, which is a response and, and one of the greatest defense of the revolution. And all he says is something like, you know, there are good things in both the letter and the response, or something like that. So, you know, he, he didn't disagree entirely with Paine, apparently, um, but no, they were on, on opposite sides on the French Revolution. Um, no, there's no, uh, to, uh, to my knowledge, and I think I would know, that there's no record of a conversation between them. I mean, where, uh, um, I, I talked to a few of you at, at lunch today about how Jefferson became, kind of got worse and worse over the course of his life with regard to slavery. Washington got better and better. I, I mean, you know, you're grading on a curve here, I guess. He, he didn't free a, a, any of the people he enslaved till after his death, but, you know, he, started out as a pretty conventional southern slaveholder and, and grew, seems to have grown more uncomfortable with it um, as, as he aged to the point where, as you say, in his will, he um, freed those whom he could free. So, some were part of Martha's estate that he, he couldn't free. But um, yeah, so he improved on that, that, that score. But no, I, there's no record of him talking with, with Morris about it. And they didn't, you know, again, they were, they were friends and they were friendly, like when, during the Constitutional Convention, when there was a break while the Committee of Detail was, was writing the first draft constitution in the middle of the summer, the two of them went trout fishing together over by Valley Forge. So, you know, they seem to have been genuine friends, but, you know, they didn't, and, and uh, Morris obviously worked for Washington when he was the, the minister to France, but he was in Paris, but, you know, they didn't spend a whole lot of time, you know, living in the same city even. So they, um, yeah, it was more of a long distance friendship for the most part, I guess. Right. Good. This excellent question. He doesn't say a whole lot on that, that kind of method of constitutional interpretation, but I do want to say something. So there's a, a really fascinating article um, on Morris, very long law review article at the uh, University of Michigan Law Review by Bill Trainer, who's the, the dean of Georgetown Law, who I've gotten to know reasonably well over the course of writing this. So he wrote a, a very long law review article on, on Morris's pending the Constitution. And his focus, so again, my focus is just kind of what did he argue, what did he envision with respect to all the branches and, and so forth. Um, Trainer's real uh, focus is on the process of drafting the, the Constitution in the ways where, um, the, the, so the, the way he sets it up, he, he calls the, the, his piece the case of the dishonest Scrivener. And the question is, did he try to smuggle any of his own political preferences into the Constitution? Right? So the, the, the delegates agree on X, and he you know, just tweaks it, chooses a different word here or there to make it more of a Federalist, right? capital F Federalist um, Constitution. And Trainer's argument is that absolutely he did. He finds, I think, 15 different places in the Constitution where you know, Morris tries to, you know, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Sometimes we, you know, we, um, 
nobody has noticed even the changes that he made, but places where he made changes to try to make the Constitution fit his own vision better. Um, and Trainer also shows that during the early years of the Republic, Federalist people like Hamilton would point to exactly those passages and say, look at the words on the page, right? This is what we all agreed to, and pointing to Morris's words sometimes rather than what, what the convention had actually agreed to. Um, so it, he wasn't beyond, <laughs> you know, um, or, or if, if Trainer's argument is right, which I think it probably is, he, it wasn't beyond him to, to do that somewhat sneaky thing. Um, but he, he doesn't have a whole lot of kind of um, programmatic statements to, of the kind that you kind of find from Madison about, you know, this is how the Constitution ought to be interpreted in terms of, you know, its public meaning or whatever. He just didn't, I can't think of any statements where he, he, he speaks to that. Yeah, although, so he, he chose some, so again, uh, well, maybe I didn't say this here. He didn't actually want to be appointed as, as a delegate to the, the convention. He was appointed against his will. And then afterward, again, he refused to even contribute to the Federalists. He went off to, to do business stuff in France. So he, he sometimes only participated when he was, you know, dragooned <laughs> into doing so. He, he wasn't as, you know, the kind of public servant that John Adams was, say, who spent, you know, 50 years doing one, one, one post after another. Um, yeah, so his vision, I, I guess, I don't know, that's an excellent question, one that I don't know I can summarize. I mean, it's a lot of the things I said, you know, he's pro-commerce, anti-slavery, once, you know, he envisions, you know, maybe not quite the Hamiltonian, like we're gonna play this grand role on the world stage and be this great commercial empire, but something a lot closer to that than Jefferson's, you know, virtuous yeoman farmers, uh, you know, exercising political power on the local level. Um, he, you know, I, and I guess it should also be said, right? He says, I came here as a representative of America. That very fact makes him unrepresentative, right? Most people were far more provincial, far more state-centric than he was. So he was, um, yeah, it's uh, ironic just by saying that. He, 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 he showed his own unrepresentativeness or un distinctiveness um, in that regard. But yeah, it's a good question. I don't know that I have a single sentence or phrase that I would use to sum up his vision of what America would be, but again, Definitely more Hamiltonian than Jeffersonian. Yeah, I, I, I do, I agree with you that the, it seems like they should, that there's not a whole lot of record of them interacting or hanging out. So at the beginning of the convention, Mor Morris is one of them who was invited to, to Franklin's house when they basically trapped the Virginia plan. Um, in fact, he, he and James Wilson had enough influence on that, that trainer, the, the same guy with the, the Law Review article says, we shouldn't call it the Virginia plan, it should be the Virginia and Pennsylvania plan, because the, you know, Morris and, and Wilson played such an important role, it wasn't all, all Madison. Um, and, and so that took place at Franklin's house, but no, there aren't a whole, oh, actually no, there is one other um, instance I can think of. So I, the only time they were together that I know of is that during this, this time in, in Philadelphia, during the convention, and Franklin's very old by this point. He's you know almost impossible to stand up. He's suffering from gout and kidney stones and, and the like. So he, he's very, very aged. Um, but at the, the very end of the convention, they had, so, they're trying to have at least the appearance of unanimity for, for the, the Constitution, right? They want to say that, you know, we all supported it. And so Morris, the kind of 
quasi-Machiavellian that he is, comes up with a way. So he, what he says is, we should sign not that we approve the Constitution, but I, I, I can't remember the exact language, but like, in witness of the fact that the, all the states present on this day support it. So, so they're not signing saying, I, you know, Joe Schmo support the Constitution. I'm just recognizing that all the states present on that day, which is only 11, by the way, um, approve, approve the, 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 the Constitution. And he had Franklin put forward this motion to disguise its provenance, right? You know, the venerable Franklin. And so they, they were kind of in cahoots, I guess, on the last day of the convention. So um, it seems that they did work together some, but there aren't like, uh, you know, good stories of them hanging out or telling tales or anything. Um, we do have, uh, you know, most of the other founders he did, as I say, he was Hamilton's best friend. Um, he hung out with Jefferson some in Paris and they did not, Again, like Morris and Payne did not see eye to eye on the French Revolution. Apparently, um, someone recorded that, uh, um, how did they put it, that Jefferson blushed to his temples at some of Morris's immodest expressions or something like this. So apparently, Morris was, you know, was a bit of, too scandalous for, for Jefferson's taste. Um, he, they did not get along well as, as, uh, when Jefferson was president and, and Morris was in the Senate. He, he fought against most of what Jefferson did. Um, he has one, a great line in his, uh, you know, he has very terse lines in his um, diary, one of which he, he says, went to dine at the president's, meaning Jefferson's, he is utopia quite, right? Just the, the kind of utopianism of, or, or, or you know, idealism of, of Jefferson. So, um, yeah, but in terms of him and Franklin, there's not a whole lot there.